Hello, I believe I am live. So as you are hopping on, just say hi so I know who's here. If you are catching the replay, then you can do hashtag fearful avoidant so I can say hi to you and I know that you watched. Um, so today we are going to be talking about all things fearful avoidant attachment. So we're going to be covering what fearful attachment is. We're going to be covering what it looks like. We, we're going to be covering what the cause of it is and tips and solutions and things you can do about it if you have fearful avoidant attachment. This is a one of the more confusing attachment styles and it's also one of the lesser common ones. So it's not so much in the dating literature. So we're going to be talking about all the things to know about this particular attachment style and maybe it resonates with you or maybe you can apply some of the information that I will be talking about to just like other partners. Like maybe you are dating someone who may actually be this style or you have in the past and it will just help you understand what was actually going on. So as you're hopping on, say hi. And what I'd love to know is if you know what your attachment style is, what attachment style do you think you have? So are you anxious? Are you avoidant? Are you secure? Or are you maybe fearful avoidant? Just so I have an idea of like who's on and where you're coming from. All right, so whether you're fearful avoidant or not, it's still gonna be good information to have. Hello, Fernanda. All right, so let's get started. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Elizabeth. I'm a dating coach and I focus on helping my clients basically take care of all the stuff that's in the way of them being able to attract and have an amazing relationship. So we're focusing on things like attachment. We're focusing on things like self-worth and self-love. We're focusing on things like what do you need to know about men so that you can really understand what's going on when you're dating someone. So all these different things are pieces of what I do. And so my work really comes from my own struggle with dating and relationships because really in my life it was not easy for a really long time. So I was always falling for basically unavailable men. And or and the other side of this was that I was choosing men who I wasn't actually in love with but who wouldn't leave me and who were way more in love with me than I was with them so that I could feel safer, I could be in control. So my first major heartbreak happened when I was 21 and it took me really about three years to fully move on from that guy because I did not have any of the tools that I've got now. And so the second major heartbreak that I had, actually it was not heartbreak, it was just a relationship, turned out to be very controlling and emotionally manipulative. And that was a pretty long relationship. It was like in and out, lots of turmoil. And in that relationship, I really kind of lost my self-esteem and my sense of self and trust in myself. And I ended up leaving, but then carrying a lot of the trauma of what had happened in that relationship for years until I really worked through all of it. And so that relationship created the fearful, uh, fearful avoidant attachment style that I actually did have after that because of all the stuff that had happened. And so I had that, I just started working through all of that stuff before I met Eric. And then meeting him was like the final like part where I really figured out what was going on. Because previous to that experience, before that traumatic relationship, I'd had lots of anxiety about men that I was into. So I was mostly just like anxious attachment you know, the whole like constantly needing to know, does he like me? Does he not? I haven't heard from him, like counting down how long it had been since he'd replied, like the waiting and waiting. And I was always falling for unavailable guys, which is the classic anxious avoid dynamic. So that was like where I was before all that happened. And then I would be totally turned off to guys who were super stable or secure. I'd literally run away. I'd be like, there's no chemistry. And so after that relationship, I became like pretty fearful avoidant because of what had happened and, and like I stopped just trusting, right? So I wanted love so badly, but at the same time, I didn't trust men because I would trusted and I'd ended up in such like a not great situation, right? And so I was choosing men after that who like, wouldn't really stick around, really, really testing because I didn't trust, right? And I felt safer that way. And, you know, I would just run. 
typically that would be what would happen after that is like get too close run. So when I did finally fall for someone, I got my heart broken for the last time. He was another avoidant attachment style type and I decided like, okay, I really, really need to figure out what the heck is going on with why love is not working out for me. Cause I just had this trail of just nothing working. And so when I started looking, I was like, okay, well, like the common denominator with all of this is actually just me. It's not them. So that's when I figured out about what I call the love blueprints, which is somewhat based on attachment styles. And I saw how what was in there was really working against me and sabotaging me even while I was trying to find love and really wanted it. And so back then I didn't actually know about attachment styles, but I got what was going on in my inner world. And so I figured out how to actually heal that stuff and reprogram the love blueprint, right? So that someone like Eric, my fiance, could actually come into the picture and I wouldn't actually run away, which is what I would do before that, right? And so when Eric and I first met, we struggled a lot. I struggled a lot in the beginning because I was still learning everything that I now coach my clients on. And so what happened was in fearful avoidant style, we got close and I ghosted him two times. <laughs> so um, now we're engaged and it's been because of all the work that I did because I was like, oh my gosh, this is something is going on here that then we could actually build a relationship after I was working through that stuff. And so now that we have this relationship, it keeps getting better and better and there's new challenges, but that old stuff is not there anymore, right? So we get to grow together, we get to create a life together, we get to become who we want to be together, which is ultimately the goal. And if you are fearful avoidant, you actually do want that even though you're running away. So that's my story, but let's get into fearful avoidant attachment now. And let me just see what you guys said. So Fernanda said she's avoidant. Hi, Sarah. Um, Ala said, is there a type that's fearful, anxious? Um, so there's anxious, there's avoidant, there is fearful avoidant. So fearful avoidant is actually the same. We're going to talk about it, but it's actually the same thing as um, if you were to say anxious avoidant. So I'm curious what you mean by fearful, anxious. What, what, what are some of the characteristics of what you experience? And did the audio, can you guys hear me? Karina, can you hear me now? Okay, so let's keep going. So our attachment patterns are established very early in childhood, right? Like these are established in childhood. And so this is the way that we relate to people specifically people that we are romantically connected with, right? So it comes from what happens with our parents and our caregivers. Okay, great, you've got audio back. Um, and so what happens is that whatever that map is of what happened there and the way that we processed it and the way that we decided to work with whatever had happened is then the way that we continue to function unconsciously, it's like a blueprint for the rest of our adult, like romantic and even sometimes not romantic relationships unless they get changed, right? And so our style of attachment affects everything from our partner selection to how well our relationships progress to how they end. It's playing into all of that. And it influences even like how we're choosing a partner, who we're choosing, why we choose them, and what our needs are and how we're going to react to our needs and how we try to get those needs met. And a lot of that is really just coming from the attachment style that you have that was created in childhood. So although our original love blueprint is built in childhood, it gets imported into our adult relationships, usually without us having awareness of how it's doing that, right? And so then our adult relationships we go through more experiences and that ends up shaping it even more and then it can morph and change as a result like for me becoming very fearful avoidant as a result of that relationship experience right and then moving back out of that into something secure right and so when we're not aware of that process we act out all sorts of patterns and behaviors without really knowing why and often we blame ourselves or our partners unfairly for what's going on. And really what it is, is it's unresolved attachment trauma that can easily just be showing up at all different points, right? And it's limiting our lives and our love lives, especially in really fundamental ways, unless 
we're working on that attachment stuff. And so it may actually be the reason stopping you from ever actually having the kind of love that you really want, right? And so I like to say that my relationship with Eric was never ever a guarantee that that was going to work out. In fact, if I had kept going the way I was going, it never would have because that was not what was in my blueprint for it to work basically. And so today we're going to be talking about fearful avoidant attachment. And this one isn't talked about as much in the attachment literature, but it is sort of sometimes it will show up. And like I said, sometimes that's formed in childhood, sometimes it comes up later on. And so I want to bring some understanding to what is actually what is it and what's going on so you can just understand better. So to start off with what is fearful avoidant attachment? So fearful avoidant attachment is a combination of both anxious attachment and avoidant attachment. And I have separate videos on each of those. So you can go back later and watch them if you want. So which means that you have a strong desire to protect yourself and to avoid relationship. And on the other hand, you still have a strong desire to be in relationship. So you have conflicting desires, right? And so while you might cling on for dear life when you feel that your partner is avoiding you, if your partner starts to feel like they're getting closer or clingy, then suddenly you flip and now you are emotionally unavailable because now they're getting too close. And so what this happens is it creates this constant push pull in, in a relationship and within you. And so there is this perpetual worry underneath that you will get hurt if you allow someone really in and yet you want someone to come in and there's this confliction happening. So this creates chaos internally, right? Because the very person that we would want to go to for safety is the same person that we're actually afraid to be close with. And so because of all of this, many anxious avoidance or fearful avoidance tend to spend their time alone and not really feeling fulfilled or ending up in abusive or dysfunctional relationships because that pattern of relating is not uh, it's there's nothing consistent about it and we'll talk about why that's happening a little bit deeper in a minute um, So do you recognize yourselves here? Does anyone here think that you might be this style? So Lainey says that describes me perfectly. Okay, that's what I thought when you wrote that comment I was like, I bet this is hers so one thing to know about the fearful avoidant is that it's really lonely being a fearful avoidant right because unlike the avoidant attachment the pure avoidant attachment where you're happy to be alone. The fearful avoidant attachment really does not want to be alone. It actually, you do crave connection and love, but it's something in you that like literally will not let you go there. It's like blocking you. So what does it look like if you've got this attachment style in real life? So often you might find yourself in pretty rocky or dramatic relationships with many highs and lows. So you might cling to your partner when you feel rejected and then feel trapped when you're too close to them and like you need to get away. And so there's this go away, no come closer, no go away kind of push pull experience going on that's creating the drama in the relationships, right? And so you are likely sabotaging relationships that have a chance because you suddenly feel this trapped feeling or like something is off and you need to get away, right? And so honestly, I did this with all these guys afterwards. I got really afraid when they would come close and I wouldn't, I would just feel suffocated like I needed to get away, something was wrong, right? And so if you were, you're less likely than an anxious attachment style to make tons of bids for connection because, or affection or love, because you anticipate that if you do, that might be rejected. So you won't actually chase very much. And another thing about this attachment style is that they found that you tend to have more sexual partners than other attachment styles. The reason being that sex is easy and intimacy is terrifying. And so there's a separation going on there. So the more affection that someone shows you, the more you start to freak out. And if they try to get too close, then you'll convince yourself that they're really not the right person for you or there's something wrong and you start limiting interactions with them. So, but then what will happen is that if that person starts to seem to lose interest in you and they start pulling away, then suddenly there's a fear of abandonment coming in and like, oh my God, they might go away. And then you start being more of the anxious attachment and you're back in this cycle again. So pull away, come closer, pull away, come closer. So for example, 
you notice that, oh my gosh, he's not sending me a good morning text every day anymore. Or he made plans to hang out with his friends this Saturday and he usually spends time with me. And these subtle changes will then trigger you to be in like a heightened state of awareness of impending like the doom of the relationship. And these signs you believe might be the, the signs of the end of the relationship. And so the anxious attachment part comes up. But then there will be times when the partner, your partner, actually wants to spend more time together and wants to make even more plans for the future and they start getting closer to you and then that will actually trigger fears about things moving too fast, that the relationship is moving to a stage where the person isn't, you're not actually ready for and so you start to distance yourself and so maybe you're getting in contact less, you're making up reasons why not to see that person and then we see the avoidant coming up. So I want to point out that these are things that you're not doing like consciously, right? They're all happening at a automatic or more subconscious level where you can actually feel like it's completely rational what you're doing and it makes total sense and you can explain it like it was a rational decision. So you may even see that in relationships with friends, sometimes these blueprints get imported to other relationships as well, you may notice that it's actually hard for you to get too close to anybody at all because of the trust factor. Cannot actually get too close with anyone. It's really hard to. So you might let someone in and then pull away and withdraw after because you actually feel a little too exposed. So there will be the people you really trust around you and then everybody else who you don't really think you can. Um, so Sarah, I'm going to talk about that at the end. <laughs> So the other thing to know is that a really common experience for fearful avoidance, and this is unfortunate, but is that you may likely end up or have been, not now, but have been in an abusive relationship at some point. And the reason for that is because of that internal chaos, it kind of matches how you experience love. And we'll talk about where that comes from originally, like childhood. And so that the thought is always behind it, like love is actually maybe painful. And so there's also a low self esteem there as well. And so it's actually pretty easy to end up in these not good relationship situations, but not really be able to get out or see what it for what it is. So the other thing about this type is that you may be seeking approval from others to make you feel like worthy or good about yourself, right? So that you, um, you want to be seen in a certain way, right? But then it's masking all the stuff that's underneath. So as a fearful avoidant, you have a chronically like doubly activated or on off activated attachment system. So it can be over activated and under activated over activated attachment system. Um, this is when you are in like fight flight uh, because you are in your anxious attachment and it also can be, um, I think I said this wrong, but under activated the other way around um, when you are in your avoidant attachment and trying to like calm yourself down. Right. And so your nervous system is compl is always like flipping, flipping, flipping. Um, so what do you do to try to regulate your nervous system? Well, you'll be doing the two behaviors that actually belong with the anxious and the avoidant attachment. Right. So if you are feeling like someone is coming too close, then you are wanting to get away. Right. And so you're using any attachment dissociating strategies like pulling away, sabotaging the connection being really critical of that person, looking for what's wrong and finding all these problems with the person and anything that will basically allow you to emotionally distance. But then they start to pull away and then we see the anxious attachment stuff coming up like protest behaviors to, to get your partner's attention, to pull them back in, bids for connection, um, any of those things. So you'll see those two things. So you're basically blowing hot and cold because you want the closeness and then you fear the closeness because maybe you'll feel helpless or trapped or suffocated, right? And so you're constantly going between the two. So one of the unique things that is really found mostly in the fearful avoidant attachment style is that you will also have testing behaviors. And this is because you feel that people will betray you or have betrayed you, or you just cannot trust their sincerity, right? So there's like a, a trust factor that is really missing. And so you're constantly testing potential partners because whatever your wound was around trust in the past, you're afraid that it will happen again, right? And so if 
if you see something, you're, you're basically constantly looking for signs that this person will betray you in some way, betray your trust and not be what you want, right? Not be what you expect. And so you may try out different negative or challenging behaviors to see how the person you are dating is going to respond. Will they reject you? Will they hurt you, right? And so um, you'll, see, you'll do different things just to see what is this person going to do, right? And so I, I can say it will be whatever your wound is around too. So I can say like for Eric, when I started dating him, my wound had come from that previous relationship, right? And so my personal boundaries had been violated a lot. Um, I had been like, felt like there was gaslighting going on, emotional manipulation going on. And so I was testing him to see, like literally all the time testing to see what will he do if I do this? What will he do if I do that? If I pull away, will he give me my space? If I say that, whatever, all these different things, because I didn't trust, right? And I didn't feel safe. So that would be the testing kind of behaviors that come from the fearful avoidant, right? So you also, at the same time as all this is happening, there's this fear that, that you may be rejected, right? And so you may do something first or even prematurely to ensure that the relationship goes nowhere so you actually can't be rejected, right? And so this is more of the self-sabotage coming up because often underneath is the feeling like I'm such a mess, I'm just not good enough or I'm not lovable anyways. So, you know, I wish someone would really see me and love me, but that won't happen, right? And so your your guard comes up, your armor comes up and it kind of locks people out as a self-protection because it's not gonna happen anyway, so better protect, right? And so you will avoid showing your true emotions. You will avoid being truly vulnerable because of the fear of the rejection that could happen or that someone could use that against you, right? And so unless you are sure that it's safe, it's unlikely that you will allow that to happen, right? And so this is why many of you probably are avoiding dating at all or avoiding dating anyone who could actually be someone you could have a lasting relationship with because of all of these defenses coming up, right? And so you might even wonder like, what do I really want and why can't love just be easy? Why is it so hard for me, right? And so when you're dating someone, you are seeing all these potential signs that this person can't be trusted or they will hurt you. Like you're, you're seeing them literally everywhere and your brain is constantly overanalyzing and looking for whatever you are most afraid of. It could be that he will cheat or that he won't commit or that he will hurt you or that he is abusive or whatever has happened in the past that caused this wounding, right? You're looking for that. Mm -hmm. And so your perspective is probably not really based on reality. What you're looking at and looking for is maybe not based on reality um, because it's hard to actually see through to what's true. And so you may actually feel sometimes like you were very misunderstood by other people or victimized by other people or rejected in relationships. And what we tend to find is that if we were to dig in, we'd find that there may have been a way that this attachment style had set that up. And maybe that didn't happen the way it felt like it did. So what you'll be feeling is that the, your inner world is, is pretty painful, right? And so what's happened typically for fearful avoidance is that we dissociate from that pain right? And so what's really going on underneath is not something that you actually have a connection with. The pain is actually dissociated. And so many fearful avoidance have or had substance abuse issues and addictions or depression or anxiety or eating disorders or other things that really are manifestations of unresolved emotional stuff with this attachment style. So the things that you've got going on that the rest of the world doesn't really know because on the outside, you really do seem like you've got it together. You're independent, you're successful, you're likable, right? But you've got, you, you typically have put on this good show of confidence or happiness, right? And this is your armor that you go out in the world with, but inside you actually don't feel any of that. So underneath there's a sense deep down that there is something wrong or unacceptable about you and that you are not really worthy or deserving or lovable and that you would be hurt or rejected. And at the same time, there's also a lack of trust about other people, right? And so it's like 
doubly doubly wounded in the trust area don't trust myself don't trust other people and so there'll be challenges with self-confidence and a lower self-worth that are really at the core of this attachment style it's a negative view of yourself and that produces fear of being rejected or hurt by someone and then there's this underlying fear that other people are also not trustworthy so it's a negative view in both ways um, so Sarah asks, does this differ from disorganized? No, this is this is disorganized. There's like a lot, for some reason, a lot of different words that describe this attachment style. Um, it's the same thing. Okay, so basically what's going on with fearful avoidant, pretty heavily guarded, right? And so this is why you only have very few people in your inner circle, very few people that are really trusted, and nobody else really sees the real you or really seals all of you, right? It's because of getting close is not something that you would want. So there's a lot of loneliness there, right? And this is a different kind of loneliness almost than the anxious attachment because the anxious attachment is much more of an open book, whereas you are not. So many, many of my clients who come to me and they've got this style, um, they got all kinds of messaging growing up that made them not really trust themselves. So they often chose careers that weren't in alignment with what their child self would have chosen. And, you know, a parent said, that's not what you can do, do this, right? And they often then choose to marry partners um, who the parents would approve of, right? The right guy or the nice guy. And, you know, the one who would let them fulfill the expectation that they get married and have kids and do it at this time, right? A certain time in their lives. And so they felt like this is probably the best that I can get because they don't feel good enough, right? Um, there's that underlying feeling of like, this is probably all I could get. And so the guy that they end up marrying often is not as high achieving as them. Um, in fact, tends to be the opposite. Um, and not earning the money in the household tends to be not as good with money, tends to be more irresponsible um, and just not fulfilling what they really need. And so that marriage eventually falls apart, right? And then there's like, you're gonna take a lot of time off from love because that was so difficult to go through, so painful, and it reinforced all this stuff, right? And so often they'll come to me thinking that we're, we're just gonna heal like that stuff in that relationship so that they can be open for love, but then they don't expect or even realize that there's all these other ways that this attachment style is showing up in their lives. Like maybe not really living their, their true like soul's real desire for what to do in this life, right? Or their authentic self. And so this is something that we are also working on allowing to really be there. So where does fearful avoidant attachment start? So one place that fearful avoidant attachment can start is childhood, right? And so in childhood, if that's where it came from, it's likely that you had the perception of, or the experience of being neglected and maybe even abused. So at least the caregivers were distant or inconsistent in their availability and not emotionally responsive to your need. So it's likely that your parents had a difficult relationship with each other. It could have been emotional abuse. It could have been physical abuse. It could have just been like a chaotic household with a lot of fighting, right? And so you came out of that experience believing that love or closeness is painful because that is what it was like growing up. And so that's where it starts. So if you're raised in these environments, then we become hyper vigilant for cues of threats and at the same time, like loss of connection kind of threat, and at the same time, avoidant of closeness and intimacy because of the pain there, right? And so it could have been like big trauma or it could have been small trauma, right? It could have just been like scary parental behavior, um, meaning that the, their parent wasn't like overtly threatening, but maybe they were very depressed or just had too much on their own plight, like maybe mental challenges or physical challenges or just most emotionally not very expressive. And so the child learns, I cannot go to my parents for comfort and protection. They will not be there. So the other way that this attachment style typically would form or develop, grow to be stronger um, could be as a result of a traumatic or an abusive relationship, right? So where the person who loves you and is supposed to love you and who you love is also threatening and hurtful at the same time, right? Because then we get love is painful or 
people get close and they hurt me. So then you can see why in either of these cases you would be avoiding intimacy, right? And so the, that's really where it's coming from is, is going to have been some traumatic event or it's going to have been childhood. Okay. And so while there are amazing traits that developed as a child to get through, to cope as an adult, there start to be costs to having those things there. So let me just go back and see what are the comments? Yes, exactly. I do those friends too. Yep. Mm -hmm. Very common. Fernanda, outside validation. And Sarah, do we need to be conscious of the I'm not lovable feeling because I don't feel that way, but not to say it's not there. Some, um, that's not always the one. Sometimes there's something else. It could be something else for you. Is this why I feel like most of my friends are not compassionate enough as a reason not to open up so I can keep a distance? Uh, it could be. So like I said, it's the perception that we tend to have if we've got that attachment style is not always accurate. Um, but sometimes it is. I don't want to invalidate what could be, actually be truth. So I can't know just from a comment. It, it's possible that that perception is inaccurate. Maybe not. I don't know. We would have to talk so I could hear a little bit more about what's going on. But let's talk about tips. So things that you could start to do right now. So the first thing is to recognize that your emotions may not be giving you accurate feedback about what is actually going on in your relationships. And we've talked about the perception is not always accurate for this style. It's actually really hard to see what's true and not. So your perception may be skewed because of what we talked about, right? And because the nervous system fight flight is constantly being activated. And so it's really important to learn how to differentiate between true warning bells and fear because you wouldn't want to get into a really negative relationship, not trusting your, your gut, your instinct. And at the same time, it can be hard to tell the difference because of those experiences that we went through when everything just kind of seems like a threat. The second one is that if you are triggered, take a long time out, like sometimes several days out before you take action based on those emotions because of what I just said about it not always being clear. The third one is to work to build your inner sense of safety, self-trust, and self-worth before you want to go out again. Because without that being there, the pattern will just keep replaying. And so the most important thing is to heal the past traumas and experiences that created this fearful avoidant attachment. So not only will you want to heal the past, but you will want to work with rewiring, rewiring your love blueprint and developing a new set of ways of being that are, that are healthy, that are grounded in reality, that are going to work for you to get what you really want. So when you have a fearful avoidant attachment style, your emotions won't really be a good barometer of what's going on. I can't tell you how many times with Eric, I thought something was going on that was not and my emotions were wacky, crazy, right? And so you often don't know how you should feel or respond to in emotionally charged situations. That's really tricky. So what can you do? So what happens when you run away and pull away as a result of this activated attachment system, nervous system, is that you basically run straight into your own defensive wall. The part of you that's trying to keep you safe, trying to protect you is also pulling you away. And so this defense is not a rational thing. It's housed really, really deep in the emotional layers of your brain, right? Because this is related to traumas, right? And it is automatically triggered by signals from the environment. So in, until those are like deactivated. So it doesn't really care about your rational thought processes or your need for love and affection. It would actually rather you be sad, lonely, and by yourself than be where you are, right? And so running is just going to happen until this stuff is worked through. So what you've got to do is get in touch with what's in your love blueprint. Where does this come from and rewire it? And this is how my work with clients works, right? We do this in three months. It's not like therapy because therapy is more for like general maintenance, um, responding to what's current, whatever you bring. Um, it doesn't have this specific direction or focus on this. It's not designed for this work. It's more like general, right? And so I've heard from clients that they have spent years in therapy and they're, they're either like, you know, it made me worse. Sometimes it just reactivates everything or it gave them awareness, which is the first step 
but they weren't actually then able to shift anything or to remove the triggers to, or heal the actual wounds to actually create transformation in themselves or do it without like a crazy amount of time in therapy, um, which because it's not what it's going to do, right? That's not the purpose of it. And so when they'll come to me, they'll say like, I know what my issues are. Uh, I know, I don't know what to do about it. Like nothing I've tried has worked. I've got like sort of strategies, but like as, hasn't actually shifted anything, right? So I have awareness, but I still have the problems. And like I said, awareness is the first step. Talk about this a lot, but information is not transformation. There's more that has to be done to get the transformation. And so other, other coaches, like dating coaches or whatever, like they're not, they're not doing this either, right? And so this is why you can end up still basically feeling the same afterwards. Um, and so, you know, I've heard from women things like I worked with even like Tony Robbins trained coaches and no results, like still same issues with men, still same wounds showing up, still same kind of patterns. And so what I told them is that this happened because most coaches don't know how to get at what's at the root of these issues and they don't actually know how to shift that for you, right? And so they're dealing either more with behavioral or cognitive level, but none of them are dealing with, or just informational a lot, but they're not dealing with the emotional perceptual shifting at the trauma level, right? Um, and so you're not gonna find somebody who is doing the kind of work that I'm doing the way that I'm doing it with the kind of results that, that my clients are getting. It's unusual um, because we're working with the love blueprint that includes your attachment system, your belief system, your nervous system, your brain. And the truth is that your nervous system and your brain are connected and that creates your attachment system, right? And so we're working with, if, if you're coming and you've got fearful avoidant attachment, for example, we're working with how to not run, right? What is coming up when you want to run? Um, how do you, how, how do you, what do you do instead, right? And how do you actually work with that so it stops being this thing that's coming up all the time? Or how do you open up and let the walls down and let the protection down? There's a whole process to being able to do that. It's not just thinking, oh, I'm, I'm just going to do that differently. It doesn't work like that. So how do you allow yourself to actually have that connection and maintain that connection and let someone actually in and see you, right? The trust piece, healing that wound around that, right? So how to get perspective, understanding men and choosing the right man for you and understanding what's really going on because our perception can be not really getting it, right? And so this actually helps a lot with the nervous system itself too. And then like literally what actions to take in your life right? And so the most important work that we're doing is with the parts of you that need the healing, right? They're the overactive parts or they're the, the wounded parts or they're the parts that we have not actually been ever looked at before, right? And this is sometimes around the core wound, right? So you don't even need to know where yours are. You don't need to know what they are. Like we find, we do it. I help you, right? And we, we literally are just changing whatever's there. I wasn't able to heal my attraction to men who were impossible, like the one that got away or like the pining from a distance kind of partners and not choosing the men in front of me until I healed where all of it came from. And so, you know, and also going back to like that emotionally toxic relationship that had made me so distrustful after that, right? And also ashamed that I'd been in that situation. Like there's layers and layers of stuff there. And so doing the work around that with the parts, with the walls, with the inner child, learning to, to like regulate nervous system so that you aren't creating distance, so that you aren't running away, so that you aren't feeling unseen and unmet and wanting love and not having that, right? And so that craziness that you experience as the fearful avoidant does not have to continue, right? You can rewire that patterning and the nervous system and all the things related to that. So of course, if you want to do this work with me, then you can send me a message. I will give you a link so you can book a consult and then we can get on the phone and see if we're a fit. It is a three month like work that we're gonna do. There is a defined process I'm taking you through that has worked for my clients that gets them these results, that changes these things for them, that helps them bring in those partners, right? The really, really right partners. And so, you know, you get support in between calls, you're gonna get like things to do outside the, the calls. Um, you get my brain basically on everything that I know about attachment, attraction, men, all of this patterning and what to do about it. 
So if you're ready, then you can send me a message. I'd love to get on the phone with you. Let's talk. Let's figure out what we can do for you. Um, and so you, you'll just book it in my calendar and then we'll get on the phone and we'll talk. Um, so let me see, are there any questions about all of this stuff that I've said about fearful avoidant attachment? Does it make sense? First of all, let me know, does it make sense to you? And then do you have any remaining questions? Let me just see if I have gotten all the comments. Uh, Sarah, yes, also avoidant, all, so she asked, does any other style have this inability to get in touch with the actual emotion? Yeah, avoidant, uh, also, this is like coming from the avoidant piece. This is my biggest issue in life. I can't access my intuition because it's being shaded over by my overactive. Yes, 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 so, so many of my clients come to me with that, that exact same thing. Um, it can also show up in avoidant. I found that it's much more common in the fearful avoidant because this is a self-trust issue avoidant is a little different than that um and so we 100 percent you get back in touch with that and yeah um yeah yeah so i see what you're saying it's let's see and then so it looks up trying to get to the root of things can we do it without digging for that so i've done so much there it locks up trying to get um so this wouldn't it wouldn't be like therapy it would be a different experience for you and you would not be locking up the way that I do this work. Yeah, it would be, you would be like breathing for the first time. It would be like a huge release. <laughs> um, so it would be, it would be different. It's not, it's not done the way that you do therapy. Uh, so Leslie said, thank you for demystifying it all. Yes, you're welcome. Any other questions before I sign off? I'll just wait a second because I know it takes a little bit for them to pop up. I hope this was enlightening. No other questions? Okay, so then I am going to sign off and I will see you ladies later. Bye!